The EU will seek a balanced deal for Britons after Brexit, says the head of the European Commission. Jean-Claude Juncker says he will try to ensure a good deal, but Malta's Prime Minister says it shouldn't be better than EU membership. We want a fair deal for the United Kingdom. That deal necessarily needs to be inferior to membership. Here, Theresa May defends her Brexit plan to MPs, but is accused of bypassing Parliament over any eventual deal. We'll have the latest from Westminster and from Brussels, also on the programme this lunchtime. Thousands of British tourists are being flown out of the Gambia after a state of emergency was declared there. Unemployment falls to its lowest level for more than a decade, with 1.6 million people now out of work. And shock at the Australian Open as Britain's Dan Evans pulls off the best win of his career, beating seventh seed Marin Cilic. In the south, how military families are suffering in cold, damp housing, even after the maintenance firm was threatened with losing its contract. And animal charities working to tackle an increase in the number of organised dog fights. Good afternoon and welcome to the BBC News at One. The President of the European Commission, Jean-Claude Juncker, has told the European Parliament that he will do everything he can to ensure that the negotiations over Britain's exit from the European Union end in a good result for all concerned. But he also admitted that the negotiations would be, as he said, very, very, very difficult. Our Europe correspondent Gavin Lee has this report. A clear view from Westminster, cold comfort to EU officials meeting in Strasbourg's European Parliament today. A sad, surrealist state of affairs, that was the brief tweeted response from Donald Tusk, the President of the European Council. And while the sudden clarity was welcomed here, seven months after the Brexit vote, the verdict from the Maltese Prime Minister, Joseph Muscat, whose country holds the rotating EU presidency, is that he will work to make sure Britain doesn't get a better EU trade deal than what's already available. This is not a happy event for us. We want a fair deal for the United Kingdom, but that deal necessarily needs to be inferior to membership. This should not come as a surprise to anyone. Over the last years, I've been sorry to see that solidarity was not always forthcoming. And I deplore the fact that for the first time in the history of Europe, some countries have not applied the decisions taken in an area as sensitive as asylum, although significant progress has been made in other places. There was reason for optimism elsewhere. Hungary's foreign minister called for the widest possible trade deal, warning of the risk of making Europe less competitive if forcing Britain to make quick trade deals elsewhere. The clarity of Theresa May's message has brought more questions and the scepticism across Europe about whether a clean break from the EU is possible. There are less than 10 weeks to go until Article 50 is triggered and with what Theresa May has now clearly set out, negotiators on both sides will be starting to formulate their opening positions. Gavin Lee, BBC News, Brussels. Well, Theresa May has been defending her plans to leave for the UK to leave the European Union. During Prime Minister's question, she told MPs that she wanted to put the divisions over Brexit in the past and work for an outward-looking, prosperous, tolerant and independent Britain. But she was criticised by the Labour leader, Jeremy Corbyn, who accused her of snubbing Parliament by not allowing it full scrutiny of the eventual deal. Here's our political correspondent, Ian Watson. If newspapers had a vote, Theresa May would be guaranteed a landslide election victory. Jeremy Corbyn! But there was a less gushing response when she faced MPs for the first time since her speech. The Labour leader said she should have delivered it here in Parliament. Restoring parliamentary democracy while sidelining Parliament. <laughs> not, not so, not, Mr Speaker, it's not so much the Iron Lady as the Irony Lady. 
Jeremy Corbyn didn't just attack the venue for the speech, but the content, particularly the Prime Minister's warning that Britain could become a low-tax, low-regulation economy if she failed to get a good deal. Can I urge her to stop her threat of a bargain basement Brexit? But the Prime Minister quoted Jeremy Corbyn himself to argue that Labour had no Brexit plan of their own. She has said that leave the single market, then at the same time says she wants to have access to the single market. I'm not quite sure how that's going to go down in Europe. I think we have to have a deal that ensures we have access to the market. <laughs> I've got a plan. He doesn't have a clue. But one of her own MPs urged her to debate each part of her plan here in the House of Commons. Would she please consider at least publishing all those 12 objectives in a white paper so that we can debate them here in this place on behalf of all our constituents. What we usually see at Prime Minister's questions is the opposition attacking the government and the government responding. But Brexit cuts through party lines and party loyalties. So there are some Conservatives who are worried about Theresa May's decision to come out of the single market. And within the Labour Party, some of Jeremy Corbyn's own backbenchers think he isn't taking a strong enough stance in opposing the Prime Minister's approach. This former shadow chancellor says his own party leadership should have been more vocal in standing up for membership of the single market. For me, that is a pretty black and white issue and it's something that we should call out and say it's bad for our economy. That is our duty as, I think, Labour members of Parliament. Back in the Commons, the SNP argued that leaving the single market would hit jobs and incomes. Does the Prime Minister believe that this is a price worth paying for her little Britain Brexit. I repeat what I said earlier. We will be working to ensure that we get the best possible deal in terms of access to the single market. So divisions between and within the political parties were on display even before we begin the formal process of leaving the EU. Ian Watson, BBC News. Well, in a moment, we'll talk to our assistant political editor, Norman Smith, in Westminster. First, though, our Europe correspondent, Kevin Connolly, is in Strasbourg. And a rather conciliatory tone struck in the European Parliament this morning, though it was made clear that negotiations are going to be incredibly difficult. That's right. And, of course, given that most European politicians, especially in a place like Strasbourg here, view Brexit with incomprehension or hostility, the mood here today was pretty mild. I mean, it's worth pointing out that there was no big, well-prepared set piece to set against Theresa May's speech. We're working with a few snippets from a speech and we're working with uh, a few uh, clips from a news conference. But the tone from Jean-Claude Juncker, who's going to be a very important figure on the European side, sounded pretty conciliatory. He was pleased with what he called clarifications from Theresa May. And although the talks were going to be very difficult, he was going to do his best to make sure that there was a good outcome, fair for both sides. Everyone here will tell you the same thing. They can't afford to let Britain look like it's getting better off by leaving. So at the end of all of this, we're going to be left with a kind of semantic debate, I think, about whether the British negotiators and European negotiators understand the same thing when they say that a deal is fair and reasonable for both sides. That's where a lot of the talking is going to come. Kevin in Strasbourg. Thank you. Our assistant political editor Norman Smith is in Westminster. And how much pressure is the Prime Minister under at Westminster? Well, Sophie, you would think Mrs May would be under huge pressure, that she would be really feeling the heat because, let's be clear, she's pretty much put her head on the block with her proposed Brexit deal. More than that, she has massively ratcheted up the stakes by suggesting we'll walk away from any deal if we don't like it, by insisting that she wants to strike an agreement within two years, which many people think is hopeless ambitious and unachievable and by seeking what looks like pretty much a special golden deal for Britain where we get everything we want from the single market and the customs union and we get rid of all the nasty things we don't like. And yet I have to say Theresa May was oozing confidence in the Commons today. She was on a roll. She was swatting away criticism from the Labour leader, saying, I have a plan, I'm sticking to it, it's called leadership, you should try it. And I think the reason for that optimism is a view 
that Brussels will blink first when it comes to Brexit, that they will not want to damage trading links with Britain. They will not want to go down the road of tariffs. Secondly, I think she knows she has to walk the walk to get her game face on if she's going into these negotiations. But above all, I think she has looked at what happened to her predecessor, David Cameron, who also went to get a deal and came back with one that was widely derided. And I think she has concluded that if she is going to get a good deal, she has to be prepared to bang the negotiating table and, if necessary, to leave the negotiating table. Norman Smith in Westminster, Kevin Connolly in Strasbourg. Thank you both. Well, the Foreign Secretary, Boris Johnson, has said other countries are queuing up to sign trade deals with the UK once it leaves the EU. Mr Johnson also said the UK would not be hauling up the drawbridge despite new migration controls promised by Theresa May. He was speaking as he arrived for a two-day visit to India. Well, I think that the Prime Minister set out a very powerful, very positive vision yesterday for how we can do a deal that will not just benefit uh, our friends in the rest of the EU but also drive growth in the rest of the world and one of the points I'm going to be making here in India is that we think we can do free trade deals which will be for the benefit uh, of both our countries both Britain and India as well. Well our economics editor Kamal Ahmed is in Davos uh, queuing up is that the impression that you get? I think, Sophie, of course, in this situation where you have the world's fifth or sixth largest economy, depending on how you measure it, no country is going to say to an ebullient foreign secretary, do you know what? We don't want a deal with you. Of course, there are some opportunities. Boris Johnson has said that we could start sketching those possibilities out. He talks about writing on the back of an envelope what kind of free trade deal we can do, which can then be put in place once we've actually left the European Union. But anyone who has done trade negotiation knows the last thing they are done is written on the back of an envelope. I went in a few weeks ago to see some of the officials in the US Embassy, for example, who do trade deals. They brought out huge legal documents about how they approach trade deals. So the notion that we can sign these trade deals quickly, I think, is a difficult one to prosecute. Boris Johnson is in India, for example, where there's been big clashes on, the, on immigration. India wants um, to have easier access to Britain in terms of immigration into the country of skilled workers. Britain has not given that. So on all these deals, there is always tension. Britain, of course, as well, was more attractive maybe to some countries because it was a gateway into the EU. That gateway may now be closed. But we must never forget, and here's where Boris Johnson does have some leverage, Britain has a big economy, it has a fast-growing economy, still robust, and it is a big consumer market. So we are, we are an attractive proposition, but free trade deals are very difficult negotiations. Come on, thank you. Thousands of British holidaymakers are being flown home from the Gambia after a state of emergency was declared there. The Foreign Office is advising people to avoid all but essential travel to the country after its president refused to accept that he lost last month's election. Richard Lister reports. It's not a very good news. It's basically that we are going to take evacuate everyone back home today. Today? today. Yes, today. today. It's not what they wanted to hear. Tourists in the Gambia have been told it's not safe for them to stay. Thomas Cook has sent five aircraft to bring home almost a thousand of its packaged tourists. It will offer flights for two and a half thousand independent travellers in the coming days. For those now gathering at Banjul Airport, it's been a stressful day. We just think really it's, it's overkill and it's just trying to frighten people. To me, it feels stupid because this will all be over within 24 hours to 48 hours. Asking us to leave is unnecessary, I think, at the moment. But I understand that we need to do it. Tension in the Gambia has been building for weeks. Residents are fleeing the capital, as are some government ministers, as the political crisis here threatens to become violent. At its centre, this man, President Yaya Jame, who's refused to accept the results of last month's presidential elections and declared a state of emergency. As a situation exists, which, if it is allowed to continue, 
may lead to a state of public emergency. Opposition leader Adama Barrow was due to be sworn in tomorrow. A group of West African nations has threatened military action if he's not given power. So, last night, the British government issued this warning to tourists. The Foreign and Commonwealth Office advise against all but essential travel to the Gambia due to ongoing political uncertainty and potential military intervention following the presidential elections. If you're currently in the Gambia, it says, you should leave by commercial means if you have no essential need to remain. The Gambia's reputation as a safe haven in the sun is now in jeopardy, with thousands of tourists queuing up to leave and the country edging closer to instability and conflict. Richard Lister, BBC News. Unemployment has fallen to its lowest level for more than a decade. The jobless total dropped by just over 50,000 between September and November and now stands at 1.6 million. Average earnings were up by 2.7 per cent compared with a year earlier. But as our economics correspondent Andy Verity reports, the figures also show that after years of rapid growth, the number of people in employment is no longer growing and hasn't done since July. This farmer and food processor near Kings Lynn in Norfolk supplies root vegetables like carrots to all the major food retailers from M&S to Morrison's, but it's been squeezed. It's been forced to offer higher wages to attract the people it needs to do the work, regardless of the living wage. It says that's because the supply of workers from the rest of the European Union has now gone into reverse. We're struggling to fill positions at the minute. It's a very fluid marketplace with um, uh, inf in inflation in wages in our sector at the minute, which has been driven um, by, by some uh, EU citizens going, going home and moving from the UK marketplace, and it's creating a vacuum. In the three months to the end of November, the number of unemployed people dropped by 52,000 to 1.6 million. It remains at its lowest rate in 12 years, 4.8%. The average weekly pay packet was £477, up by £12 compared to a year ago, or 2.7%. Businesses can't always pass on the higher cost of labour by simply charging higher prices. Simon will have to wait until he renegotiates his contracts with his customers, the food companies and retailers, and they won't want big price increases. All of us are, are looking to, to try and recoup some of this back. Um, and I think the load's got to be shared by all, um, and that includes the consumer. If tighter labour markets are offering modestly paid workers the chance to bid up their wages, many economists will see that as positive. I think we're, we're seeing quite a robust end to the UK economy. It's very consistent with all the other economic data that, that we've had. Hiring hasn't slowed down materially, uh, and people are, are finding jobs, and they're finding jobs at actually improved um, wage levels. But there has been a marked change since the Brexit vote. For 20 years now, the number of people in work in the UK has been hitting new records. In the three months to the end of November, it dipped slightly and it's now no higher than it was in July. Andy Verity, BBC News. A wheelchair user has partially won his case at the Supreme Court against a bus company. Doug Pawley took legal action because he couldn't board a bus in Leeds when a woman with a pram refused to move. Our disability correspondent Nicky Fox reports. As he makes his way to the Supreme Court on one of the most important days of his life, Doug Pawley is about to find out whether his nearly five-year legal battle will end in victory for all disabled people who need to use wheelchair spaces on buses. Hi Jeff, nice to see you. This all began back in 2012 when Doug was unable to catch a bus because the space for wheelchairs was occupied by Mum and her pushchair. She refused to move, which meant Doug couldn't get on. Inside court, all seven judges unanimously agreed that First Group's policy of requesting not requiring a person to vacate the wheelchair space was unlawful. But it's only a partial victory, as it doesn't go as far as insisting someone move from the space. I feel like it will create a cultural shift, and that's what they said in course as well. So people will be aware of the fact that the wheelchair area is for wheelchair users and that they should take priority. 
the impact of today's judgment will still have wider implications. For example, any service provider with a space for disabled people will not just have to request that a non-disabled person move, they'll have to pressurise. For example, a bus driver may refuse to move from a bus stop in order to shame somebody off the bus. First Group admit they may have to amend the training they provide their bus drivers following today's verdict. We really welcome the fact that the court has confirmed that a driver is not required to remove a passenger from a bus if they are refusing to move from this space. That's really important for drivers to have that clarity. Well, I'm really happy with today's ruling. It's great that after five years of fighting and campaigning by so many people that we've got a ruling that shows that disabled people do have the right to catch a bus and that the bus company must make all reasonable efforts to make that possible. Today's Supreme Court ruling isn't clear cut, but it does pave the way for a closer look at legislation when it comes to prioritising access for wheelchair users. Nikki Fox, BBC News. The time is 20 past one, our top story this lunchtime. The EU will seek a balanced deal for Britain after Brexit, says the head of the European Commission. But Malta's Prime Minister says any deal has to be inferior to full membership of the EU. And coming up... Our American road trip has become a river trip today. Donald Trump says he wants to get this country moving again, but how is he going to do it and how can he afford it? In South today, Hampshire's police chiefs are lobbying for an increase in funding, saying the force has already done all it can to bring down costs. And Marla is getting to grips with a new hand, not a pricey prosthetic. This was created using a 3D printer. Now, during the US election campaign, Donald Trump pledged to make America great again. But as he prepares to take office, can he deliver on that promise? In the week that Donald Trump will be sworn in as the 45th president of the United States, John Kay is on a road trip through the heart of America on Route 45 to find out how Americans are feeling about Trump's presidency and whether he can deliver what he's pledged to when it comes to rebuilding America. Today, as he continues on his journey south, John is in Tennessee. If you want to understand Donald Trump's election win, this is a good place to come. Next to Route 45, the Ohio River meets the Mississippi. It's an essential artery for the US economy, carrying 80 million tons of cargo every year. But things aren't what they used to be. The locks which boats pass through here have seen better days. Nearly a hundred years old, they regularly break down, causing long and costly delays. It's around 52 hours at one time. So we a boat could be waiting out there for 52 hours before yes, coming sir. through? Yes, sir. We had Mark, the lock keeper, says it's a struggle to keep trade moving. The concrete is starting to break up and crumble. Uh, every time it gets hit by a boat, as it lands on it, it puts the pressure on it and causes more cracks, more stress on it. Uh, we patch it together and try to keep it going, but it's not going to last forever. Donald Trump has pledged a trillion dollars to rebuild America's rivers, roads and railways. A promise that's won him plenty of support round here. But he hasn't said where the money will come from. We drive on into America's rural south. There are two million farms in this country. Will a property developer president understand this business? At the University of Tennessee, students are learning how to weigh and vaccinate cattle. Stick it in, press it fully, and pull it out. They're going to be some that are more willing to go forward, and there's going to be some that are wanting to hold back. Sounds like politicians. <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> if you want to start at the back. Donald the Trump board won board nearly 80% of the vote in the Martin area. They like his confidence, and in turn, they have confidence in him. He might have a few mess-ups along the way, but eventually he'll figure it all out. 
But is farming compatible with Trump's plans for building? What about the land, the environment? Donald Trump is a man who you associate with skyscrapers and, and New York City and not with, with farming and places like this. Do you, do, you, do you think he understands you and what you want to do? I think he's going to help the small town people also. I, I don't feel like he's just going to let be the big city man when he gets in office. Uh, what about farming? Does he understand farming? Uh, not as well as some agriculture people. Whether it's agriculture or infrastructure, in these communities away from Washington, many feel Trump will be a president who finally speaks for them, someone not just following the political herd. John Kay, BBC News, Tennessee. And John will be continuing his road trip tomorrow when he travels further south to Mississippi. Now, latest figures show accident and emergency departments in Wales have again failed to meet their targets for waiting times. Meanwhile, the chief inspector of hospitals in England has warned that patient safety is being compromised because of strains on the NHS. Well, our health editor, Hugh Pym, is with me now. So the system in Wales clearly under a lot of pressure as well. Yes, Sophie, more reminders about pressure right across the system, right across the United Kingdom. Today we've got these figures for December from Wales. The key four-hour percentage of patients treated or assessed or seen within that should be 95%. What was it in Wales in December? 81%, so well short of that. It has to be said, no other part of the UK is hitting 95%, though England and Scotland are ahead. Northern Ireland is behind Wales. What we also learnt from Wales is that hospital chiefs are saying that in December, of all those admitted to A&E, 20% of patients were over the age of 85, and that was double normal levels. Another indication of the sort of pressure that the NHS is facing. And meanwhile, there's been a, a high-level warning that the NHS just simply needs more money. Yes, Sir Mike Richards is the Chief Inspector of Hospitals in England uh, at the Care Quality Commission. So this is not just another warning from another think tank or another pressure group. This is a regulator saying that because of the strains on the NHS, he is concerned about patient safety and he does think that more money will be required. This is what he had to say. I believe the government will need to put more money into the NHS, but if it does, and when it does, I think it's very important that it is spent wisely. I think we need to transform the NHS. We need to have much greater integration between GPs, primary care, care homes and hospitals. And that is beginning to emerge. And those new models of care really are important and can deliver much better quality in the future. Sir Mike Richards of the CQC. Now, the government says it has given the NHS in England the money it requires, though that is contested. The government also says that it's pushing for further integration. But I think this warning from a very senior player in the health world that actually more needs to be done, particularly money, is quite significant, given how, if you like, volatile the, the debate is about the NHS generally. Hugh, thank you. Police say that there are now more than a thousand cases of alleged historical child sex abuse in football. The figures come from the National Police Chiefs Council. They say the estimated number of victims now stands at more than 500 and almost 200 potential suspects have been identified. The mobile operator EE has been fined £2.7 million for overcharging tens of thousands of customers. The penalty was imposed by telecoms regulator Ofcom after an investigation found that the UK's biggest mobile network overcharged customers using the 150 customer services number within the EU and billed them even when the number became free to use. EE has apologised and said it has put measures in place to prevent this happening again. Britain's Dan Evans has pulled off the best win of his career at the Australian Open as he knocked out the number seven seed Marin Cilic in a thrilling four-set match. Less of a surprise was Andy Murray's easy victory over Russia's Andre Rublev, which takes him through to the third round. Catherine Downs reports. Dan Evans is no stranger to winning against the odds. On the verge of quitting tennis a couple of years ago, he's now beaten two of the world's top ten players in the last two weeks. Today's big scalp, that of former US Open winner Maran Cilic, who looked too much for Evans in the first set. The Croat won it 6-3 as Evans struggled with the sinking sun. But as the shadows lengthened, Evans came to life, breaking the Cilic serve to take the second set. And belief blossoming in the darkness, he dominated the third too. 
The fourth turned into a battle, but Evans was edging it, Nonchalant. and Chilich was struggling yeah, to keep up. With a weakened Chilich serving, Evans took his chance. And what to do after the biggest Grand Slam win of your career? Get straight on the phone, of course. With Evans through, Andy Murray was just getting started. He beat the Russian teenager Andrei Rublev in straight sets, but the match wasn't without its drama. For a while, it looked like the world number one's Melbourne chances were gone. While Murray has an appointment with an ice pack, Dan Evans is unlikely to be feeling any of his aches and pains tonight. Not a bad day's work for a player once described as the most wasted talent in British tennis. Catherine Downs, BBC News. And finally, a train from China has become the first ever to make the journey across Asia and Europe and arrive in the United Kingdom. The engine pulling 34 freight containers took 18 days to make the 7,500 mile trip to Britain, half the time of the equivalent journey by sea. It travelled through countries including Russia, Kazakhstan and Belarus before heading through the Channel Tunnel to Barking. Time for a look at the weather here now with Phil Avery. Hello. Thanks very much, Sophie. It's about this sort of time of year where a little place in the sun might hold some appeal somewhere on the costas, perhaps, or maybe not. That is the scene, about 40 minutes drive from Benidorm, no less. Uh, and it's not just there. That train journey would have been conducted across a pretty cold Europe just at the moment. You'll notice that some of that cold air, as we've been suggesting over the past couple of days, has made its way into the southeast. So you get a glorious start to the day, if somewhat frosty. I say somewhat frosty, minus 7 overnight in Fritton and in Kent. At the same time, it was about 8 degrees plus across a good many parts of northern Scotland, thanks to a flow from the Atlantic rather than something coming in from the continent. High pressure still dominant, it's fairly settled fare, but quite a variety, as I've already indicated, and we keep that theme going over the next couple of hours. So if you're thinking about the school run, perhaps, uh, or a dog walk, uh, there's a little bit of rain there close by to the Northern Isles. Uh, some brightness on the eastern side of Scotland has this been the way of it of late. Once we come down to that, uh, what I've been describing as a weak weather front, it's pretty miserable fare, if the truth were known. It's pretty murky. I've seen some of our uh, uh, weather pictures coming in from our weather washers across the West Midlands, and it's really quite murky the very best of the guaranteed sunshine perhaps across the southern counties of England and perhaps just creeping into parts of Wales but it's not really doing very much for the temperatures they'll be stuck around three four or five degrees and you can imagine as soon as the sun is going down uh, if you have to get to see the sun so those temperatures will again fall away not so much where you keep the cloud although if you've got gaps in the eastern side of Scotland and certainly further south it'll be another cold night somewhere in the south again we'll be looking at minus four possibly minus five degrees so here we go again Again on Thursday, something of a repeat performance with the very best of the sunshine across the southern counties. There may be gaps further north, especially on that eastern side of Scotland. But again, the temperatures, nothing to write home about, despite where you see the sunshine, five, six, seven, perhaps a fraction up on where we've been. And I've changed the day rather surreptitiously, but the weather is pretty much the same here. But there is a general evening out of these temperatures. It's no longer the 10 in the north and the 4 in the south. And here's the thing, getting on into the weekend, that high pressure is still very much the dominant feature. If it looks threatening out in the Atlantic, don't worry, because I think the high pressure is going to be the dominant feature, not just for Saturday, but indeed on through the weekend, which will be mainly dry, I would have thought. There will be some sunshine in there. Uh, that leads to some frosty nights, and even by day it'll be chilly. If you want to get involved with the Weather Watchers thing and see your product on the TV, there at the BBC Weather website is where you can get all the details. Sophie. So thank you. A reminder now of our main story this lunchtime. The EU will seek a balanced deal for Britain after Brexit, says the head of the European Commission, but Malta's Prime Minister says any deal has to be inferior to full membership of the EU. That's all from the BBC News at One. It's goodbye from me on BBC One. We now join the BBC's news teams where you are. Bye-bye.